Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 18th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We explain the hypocrisy of those voting to override the governor's veto of SB 140. Second, we discuss our disappointment in the legislature's reaction to the spring revenue forecast. Mostly it was yippee, more money to spend. And third, we discuss a big thing that is likely to hit Alaska right between the eyes in the same time going forward as we've been in the 21st century looking back. And now, let's join Michael. We're ready to dive into this thing and uh, and get to it. Um, a lot of good, uh, a lot of good stuff here. We're going to start off with a weekly top three, which includes uh, the hypocrisy of the override. Now, for those who haven't heard, yesterday the governor's veto uh, they failed to override it by one vote. Um, and, uh, but there was some hypocrisy baked in there and uh, you've got some thoughts on it. So let's, uh, let's get to it. Well, I wrote, uh, I wrote that, uh, the lead for, uh, uh, for this particular part of the top three before the vote, because I, because it, it, it was the same regardless of how the vote came out. And it was written initially, um, based on Elise Galvin's op-ed in the ADN in the Anchorage Daily News saying that she was going to vote for the override and she hoped her colleagues did also. And then it just become, it became even stronger when I saw Will Stapps, uh, Representative Will Stapp from Fairbanks, his op-ed saying the same thing, essentially. I'm going to vote for the override uh, in the uh, in the Fairbanks news minor. Neither of those op-eds nor any other op-ed that I saw, that I've, that I've seen throughout, with one exception that was in the Fairbanks news, or in the, uh, uh, the, Frontiersman, the Matsu Frontiersman that we've talked about a few shows back. None of those talked about, neither of Galvin's nor Stapp's, talked about who pays, who should pay for this increase that they were, that they were so adamant ought to be, uh, ought to be passed and, uh, and were voting for, uh, for the override in order to pass. Um, and, and it makes sense that they didn't talk about it because who pays would have been middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, PFD cuts. Essentially what this bill was, essentially when you boil it down from a fiscal standpoint, I'm not going to get into it from an educational policy standpoint. There are others who can talk about that better. But from a fiscal standpoint, essentially what this vote was, the way it was set up, was a vote to make a permanent cut in the PFD and a permanent increase in the BSA at the expense of the PFD because there wasn't, there isn't any other option on the table. And Elise Galvin and Will Stapp both were voting to, to make that, uh, make that permanent cut uh, in the PFD in order to slide those dollars over to education. And the hypocrisy about that is they're voting on something that's not going to affect them. They're, they're voting on something they're not going to have to pay. PFD cuts hit middle and lower income Alaska families far harder than they hit the top 20%. With the pay raise the legislature voted themselves uh, last year that took effect this year, all of the legislators are in the top 
and I've gone through the analysis. I did a, a an Alaska landmine column a few weeks ago that looked particularly at the uh, House Finance Committee that both Galvin and Stapp sit on uh, and look at the members of that committee by income, because you can find that income through their APOC reports, looked at the members of that committee and all of the members of the committee were better off, made money using PFD cuts to fund government as opposed to, as opposed to a flat tax. Flat tax was better for the remaining 80% uh, of Alaska families. And so essentially what these guys were doing, what, what Galvin and Stapp and the others who ultimately had voted in favor of the override, and I've got the list here and I'm going to go through it in a second, but, but the others who voted in favor of the override were doing was saying, okay, look, I'm in favor of this permanent increase in the BSE, BSA, and, and I'm in favor of it because I don't have to pay for it. Look at this. Look at this slick trick I've figured out. I can vote for this. I can be a hero to all those people dressed in red, red for Ed. I can be a hero to all of them, and I don't have to pay for it. I can slide the costs off on middle and lower income Alaska families. I would have a lot more respect for, and, and I would be inclined to listen to the arguments on the policy side a lot more if these legislators said, look, I think we ought to increase this spending and I'm willing to pay my share of it. But that's not what they're doing. What they're doing is saying, I ought to, we ought to increase this share of, we ought to increase this, this category of spending. And look, I don't have to pay for it. I figured out a way not to pay for it. All you rubes out there in the middle and lower income brackets, you get to pay for it. I don't have to pay for it. And it's just it, the hypocrisy of those op-eds, both Galvin's and Stapp's, that said, look, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a hero. I'm trying to do the right thing. Look at me. I'm going to vote for, for education without talking about who pays for it, without saying, and I'm willing to pay my fair share also, without stepping up and saying there ought to be a better way, there ought to be a fairer way to pay for this. I mean, even talk about the oil companies. They ought to pay a fair share of this also because they're the one, they're pushing for it through the, through the, through the chambers of commerce. They want it. Right. Um, uh, you know, they want they want better trained employees or better educated employees or whatever the, the, the mantra of the day is. They want but they don't want to pay for a share of it either, either. They want that increase in spending without an increase in revenue on their side. And, and it's just and, and the hypocrisy of those voting for it uh, in that regard is just amazing. And, and, and the list, uh, looking at the Republicans who voted for it, the Republicans who are engaged in this hypocrisy, in addition, the ones who lined up with Elise Galvin on let's vote an increase, but I don't, so we, in a way that we don't have to pay for it. Justin Refridge out of the Kenai, Will Stapp out of Fairbanks, Jesse Sumner out of the Matsu, Stanley Wright out of Anchorage on the House side. And then on the and then on the Senate side, Click Bishop, Jesse Bjorkman, out of the Kenai, Kathy Giesel, James Kaufman, you know, a guy who got elected saying, I'm a fiscal conservative. I can get this thing under control. I can control costs. I know how to do that. Voting, voting for an increase without uh, without you know being willing to pay for it himself. Kelly Merrick, Bert Stedman's, Bert Stedman, and uh, and Gary Stevens. Uh, that's that's the list to me. All of these guys, all of these people, guys and gals, claim to be fiscal conservatives, claim to be, you know, at the, at the core of their being, that we're going to look out for you. We're going to look out for you, middle and lower income Alaska families. Elect us because we're the ones who are going to take care of you. At the, at, and, and what they did was they voted to increase spending in a way that they didn't have to pay for. They're not looking out for middle and lower income Alaska families. They're looking out for themselves. After the, after the pay raise they gave themselves that pushed them all into the top 20%, now they're voting to say, but we want to increase spending for all the, for, for this stuff and for other stuff. And, and, and we want you to pay for it. We don't have, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to pay for it. We want to push the costs off on the very people that we said we were being elected to protect. It's just the hypocrisy of, of what's going on here 
and what went on in that vote and what these people who claim to be fiscal conservatives did is just intense. I also want to, I, I want to say one other thing and then, and then I'll stop ranting here for a bit. But the, 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 the real hero yesterday turns out not to have been anybody who was there, who was on the floor, who was, who was uh, uh, otherwise around the building. Rob Yunt, candidate for Senate uh, in the Matsu against David Wilson. David Wilson voted not to override the veto. If you want to look, if you, if you want to look for the 40th, the 30th, the, 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 the vote that switched it, switched the balance. David Wilson votes with a Senate majority every step of the way. He's been there for all of the spending increases. He's been there for all of the PFD cuts with the Senate majority every step of the way. Yesterday, he didn't do that. Yesterday, he voted against the Senate majority. He voted against, he voted with Shower, Hughes, um, uh, Myers, and, uh, and well, that, that was it. He voted, he voted with the, the fiscal conservatives. And why did he do that? <laughs> because of Rob Yunt. Right. So, he, could, so, he could see it. Right. So the hero of the moment, really, in 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 if you want to if you want to pick out somebody that's the hero of the moment in terms of the vote yesterday, uh, is Rob Yunt. You know, I don't know what Rob Yunt's position is on the on the PFD. I I hope it's more in line with with Myers, Rob Myers than uh, than uh, than Jesse Sumner. Uh, but, uh, but, but he turned David he probably, well, I'm sure he didn't talk to David Wilson about it at all, but he turned David Wilson's vote back over to the, uh, back over to the bright side, back over no, to the was, side. That, that was, not. yeah, that was the pressure of the reelection bid. Cause he knew that he's under pressure and he's under scrutiny right now. And he's got to stand by that vote. Uh, and, uh, I did want to point out one other piece of hypocrisy here because I just, I, when I read it. Uh, it was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, the quote from Bert Stedman uh, in uh, in in the uh, in the Alaska Beacon. Uh, Senator Stedman reminded his colleagues that SB 140 was originally written to address rural internet needs. And he said, "Now to access faster internet next year, it's all on the line for dozens of rural schools." And here's the quote. I find it distasteful, extremely distasteful, that the rural children of our state are virtually held hostage over our squabbling for the base student allocation. He later called them collateral damage. This is the guy that was holding the entire state, the entire corridor of the Kinnick Goose Bay Road people, the most dangerous road in the state. He was holding that hostage over some prerequisite funding that he wanted as well. And he's done this several times, by the way, held other things. The, the fact that he is going on to say, I found it distasteful that we're holding people hostage. What a bunch of crap. What a bunch of, I mean, just absolute, I read that quote this morning, my eyeballs almost rolled in the back of my head and locked that way. Uh, because he just, again, again, there's a massive amount of hypocrisy here, Brad. Oh, there uh, is. Yeah, well, there, absolutely. There is. And and it is all over the place. I mean, you're, you're correct to point out uh, that part by Bert, the fact that he's holding things hostage. I mean, Lyman also was, was took off on a tear yesterday about, uh, about internet funding for uh, uh, for the for rural Alaska, after Lyman, you know, for decades has has held power in the House Finance Committee and held up things and held them hostage for various various other things. It, there is a lot of hypocrisy going on on that on that side as well. Right. But 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 the thing that I mean, Jesse Sumner, never ever 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 again tell me that you're looking out for middle and lower income Alaska families in the mat suit. Never say that. Because 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 you're going to be struck by lightning if you do. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not true. You're looking out for yourself. I read that this morning and I was just, oh, really? I mean, you you you, you are the master of of uh, of holding things hostage. You are the master of this manipulation, and yet you oh you find this distasteful. Okay, <laughs> all right, you know. It's, it's when somebody else does it to him that it's distasteful. When the I mean, shoe's on the other foot that you're like, oh, well, you shouldn't do that. Well, yeah, you think? Uh, turnabout's fair play as far as that goes. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's it's crazy. And yeah, I mean, I think the whole thing, when I saw that David Wilson had voted to uphold the veto, I was just like, yeah, because he's up for re-election. And he knows. There's already, I mean, the whispers on the wind in the Matsu are 
are loud and clear at this point that he is on his way out and he's desperately trying to find anything to cling to relevance and to stay in the position right now. Yeah, well, I, Rob, without saying a word to Wilson, Rob's the one that turned him um, and and got his vote right. I am sure that David's taking a lot of flack from the Senate majority. You know, Giesel and, and, and others are probably, you know, taking him to task for it, but but you know, he, self survival is a I, <laughs> survival is a, is a is a is an amazing thing, I guess. I mean, it, may, maybe that's what Sumner and and Refridge and Stapp and and Wright tell themselves. Hey, you know, I've got a family to feed. I need to I need to find a tax form that doesn't that doesn't affect me. That that you know pushes the cost right. down to somebody else, so I don't have to pay it. Maybe yeah, that's, maybe they maybe they tell themselves they're in survival <laughs> mode too. But you can't. You cannot, Michael. I mean, at least Galvin a long time ago crossed over to that side. But you cannot tell me you're a fiscal conservative. You cannot tell me that you're that you're protecting middle and lower income Alaska families when 80 percent of Alaska families when 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 the when the vote comes and this vote was a permanent a permanent cut to the PFD in order to fund a permanent increase to K through 12. When the vote comes. You vote for it because it's financed in a way that's financed in a way that that uh, that that makes sure you don't have to pay for it. That's yeah. You can't tell me you're a fiscal conservative. You can't tell me you're looking out for the middle and lower income Alaska fa- families in your district when uh, when you do something like that. Donna asked the question that I was thinking as soon as I saw that Wilson was a no vote. Uh, she says the Senate majority is a binding caucus. Will they kick out Wilson like they have the others? That's a good question. I mean, that should have been, that was a high priority for the Senate majority. Uh, will they kick him out now? I, I'm not, <laughs> he's on Senate finance. I don't, he's, I mean, he's a sure vote for, for, I mean, they've set it up. Keep in mind how they've gone through Senate finance, right? They had shower on it. They had Hughes on it. Then shower got taken off and Hughes was still on it. And then they didn't like Hughes anymore. Cause she wouldn't, she wouldn't, follow the company line. So she was off. They put David Wilson on and David Wilson's been like a, a, an automaton, right? Just, you know, Bert says vote. Bert says vote this way. Bam. Voting this way. Um, I don't know. They don't have anybody else from that. So they can put, they can put on the finance committee and it would be pretty amazing if you, uh, if you took out Matt's, if you took out the rep, the, the, the the Senator from Matsu and, and uh, didn't have a Matsu rep on the finance committee. So, well, <clears throat> I suppose they could always put Sumner on there if they decided they wanted to. Senate, but... Senate, Senate, oh, finance. The Senate, Senate finance. Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, anyway, uh, it's uh, it's interesting to watch. And you actually went down to Juno. I saw somebody say, thank you for your testimony in Juno. I apparently missed it. What did you go down for? <laughs> I went down uh, at the request of Tom McKay. Thank you, Tom, if you're listening today. Um, to testify on Cook Inlet gas. And the the amazing thing about that is, as you've listened on the show, I've not necessarily been in agreement with Tom's, you know, direction that he's, that he's, his initial direction on, on Cook Inlet gas. But in, in, in openness, he said he wanted to listen to different viewpoints. He invited me down to testify and I did on Cook Inlet gas. So if you want to find the testimony and, and, uh, and see the, the tape of the, of the testimony, it's on, uh, on my Substack page, or it's on the on the legislative website for the House Resources last Friday. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, comes in, continues with us here. We're on to uh, our second of the weekly top three. Uh, the second one today, talking about the spring forecast and the yippee part of that, which apparently is. Yippee! Look at all this money. Or as to quote uh, Natasha von Imhoff, we've got so much money we don't know how to spend it all. Uh, but uh, Brad, give me give me the yippee moment here. Well, we talked about the spring revenue forecast uh, uh, on last week's show, and it came in uh, as as consistent with what my discussion was there. Some changes here and there, but not 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 any significant material change in uh, in the in the revenue outlook. Oil prices. Oil prices are higher uh, uh, than they were in the fall revenue forecast for FY25, and FY25 is what matters here. Oil prices were higher uh, than they were then, um, uh, than they were in the fall forecast, but production volumes continue to go down. Uh, production volumes from Prudhoe and other, other 
legacy fields, the traditional fields, uh, continue to go down faster than what than what the forecasts uh, c- consistently have been saying. And we have a faster rate of decline going on up there. And that's something I want to dig into uh, uh, in a coming landmine column or or you know, probably both also on the show here because that's a that's a troublesome development and the and the combination of the increased oil prices but lower but lower production than in the fall forecast resulted in some uptick um, in revenues for FY25. <clears throat> the reaction to it, you know, I should have expected this, but the reaction to it just sort of took me aback as I was reading uh, as I was reading through the various columns uh, where the reporters were talking about the reaction of legislators uh, to the uh, uh, to the inc- slightly increased revenues for FY25. It wasn't. <laughs> I expect too much. It wasn't okay. We can make it an additional step on toward a, a, the statutory PFD. It wasn't okay. We can put some money back. We can pay. We can pay back some of the CBR that uh, that we drew down, which is essentially a tax on future uh, Alaska generations. We can pay some of that back. <clears throat> say, pay some of that back. We can we can equalize some of what we've taken to make our lives better in the last uh, last decade. Wasn't e- there was no reaction like that. It was much more yippee. Look what we can spend on. Uh, look, we have all this. All, we have additional revenue we can spend on it. And click Bishop, you know, I, I, it, 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 he's almost the equivalent of Bert Stedman. If you want a bad quote, you can just look for what Click said about something. Uh, in the same way that you can look for what Bert said some, something about it. But in the uh, the James Brooks article in the Alaska Beacon, Click Bishop was quoted as saying was among the law lawmakers who said they hoped some of the money, some of the additional money, and to put that in context, some of the additional money will be spent on maintenance projects uh, statewide. We've got a lot of need out there. That snow removal, that s- snow removal number statewide. Maybe we've got some wiggle room now to help with snow removal in Western Alaska. It's embarrassing to look at the black mold in those schools, fire alarm systems that are defunct. So hopefully we can throw a lifeline for deferred maintenance at our K through 12 schools. Nothing about Maybe we maybe we need to report reprioritize. We got black mold. Maybe we need to take something out of someplace else, you know, in order to in order to cover that. You know, if we if we've got a problem with snow removal, maybe we need to take something some spending out of someplace else, or maybe we need to go revisit oil oil taxes, or maybe we need to get a fairer tax system uh, uh, statewide. None of that. It was yippee. We got more money in the state revenue forecast. A very thin amount of additional money in the state forecast. Look at what, l- let me think of all I can spend it on. Right. You know, I mean, but, but, nobody's, but the, asking, nobody's asking the question, why was that maintenance deferred in the first place? I mean, that was supposed to be stuff that was, we put all this money into these buildings, this huge investment in all this buildings and property. Why would we not maintain it? Oh, because we've got bigger, pro- we've got more important things to spend that money on right now. We'll just push that off until sometime in the future. Yeah, exactly. And it's just, I mean, by the time by the time that Click was was finished talking, all of the money plus some more, plus some more PFD cuts were already done. I mean, they were already out the door. He'd already spent it all, and he'd spent he'd spent even more of that. And and the reaction on the on the House side, uh, Delena voted right on the on on the veto override yesterday. But Delena just <laughs> sometimes she just their mouth gets ahead of her. And 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 in in the reaction on the House side, they asked Delana, who's a Delana Johnson, who's co-chair of uh, of House Finance, her reaction, and 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 it was there wasn't anything in there about PFDs, there wasn't anything in there about paying back the CBR. Two of the things that are, I think, most fiscally conservative, the most fiscally conservative steps you could you should be thinking about immediately when you when you look at a revenue forecast and it's forecasting additional funds. Uh, no, nothing about that. It was, well, maybe we can pay for, you know, some of the stuff we've already committed to, um, uh, and, and, you know, and look at, and look at bolstering up the, the spending side of the budget or paying for the spending side of the budget. It's their reactions are just wrong. I mean, their reactions are yippee. I got more money. How do I spend it? Yippee. I got more money. What, what special interests do I want to, do I want to, you know, rain on, um, since we've turned over all this money to the legislature, uh, what what special interest do I want to do? I want to sprinkle some additional fairy dust on. It's not how do I pay back 
you know, the, the loan we've taken from future generations by drawing down the CBR, none of that. Or how do I pay, how do we distribute the commitment we have to, uh, uh, to, to Alaska families to distribute the PFD? None of that. It's which special interest can I sprinkle additional fairy dust on? And, it's, and, and that's just disappointing. I mean, we, we, we don't have legislators who are thinking about, if we do, they didn't get quoted. <laughs> they didn't get asked. Probably another problem of the media. They ask, they go to the same people and get the same answers. But, but they, they didn't, we didn't have anybody quoted as saying, CBR, we need to pay back our responsibility to future generations. We need to pay back the loan we took from future generations first. Because, because, you know, we made our lives better by drawing down on that savings account, drawing down on the money that ought to be passed on to future generations. We made our lives better. Let's do something toward, you know, you know paying back that obligation. None of that. And, and none of, none of, oh my God, yeah, we, we need to, you know, live up to the statutory PFD. None of that. It was just, just how do I spend more? And that's, you know, that's, that's just indicative of how, our legislature has come to think about things. Oh, goody, more revenue. What can I spend right. it on? Right. Well, no, I, I, exactly. I was, I mean, I was quoting Natasha. That was from, again, we had another revenue forecast that popped up and all of a sudden they discovered that they had, I don't know, several hundred million dollars more that they were expecting to come in. And then she was basically like, well, we've got so much more money. We don't know what to spend it on. Well, how about we pay back the $10 billion that's owed to the CBR? I mean, that's an easy one right there. That's a big hole that you could just suck all the money into. But no, nobody talks about that. It's immediately like, okay, well, how do we spend it? Oh, look, I found $10,000 in the couch cushion. How do we spend that? Maybe we should pay down our debt. Maybe we should put some money back to things that we owe, including the CBR. Yeah. Yeah, they, they don't think that way, Michael. There's another, I mean, I, I wrote a, my, my column last week in the, in the landmine was basically another problem with these revenue forecasts. Revenue forecasts bounce up and down. And, and I think, I've come to think that's a big part of the fiscal problem we've gotten ourselves into. We see, we see money going up and the reaction is, how do I spend it? And then you commit to spending, you commit to making you know, additional capital projects. That was one of Delana's things. Maybe we can spend it on capital projects. We commit to uh, building additional things and then we can't fund them. We can't fund the programs. We can't. We can't do maintenance on the on the buildings on the additional things we've built. Um, and 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 the revenue forecasts go down, and then the revenue forecasts go up. I think I think everybody who's really thought about this issue deeply understands that we ought to be basing that these revenue forecasts ought to be sort of nice to have things. Indicate. But we, yeah. yeah, but we ought to be basing our budget on averages. Money in the bank. Right. We do that. We do that with the PFD. We do that. Well, back when we had a statutory PFD, we do that on averages. We do the POMV draw on historic averages. We look at money that we that we have in the bank, and uh, and and drawing well, it at, at, at that rate. But but on on oil, on oil, you know the thing that the thing that really drives the budget on oil, we just bounce up and down along the road. This has been our problem for years, Brad. I mean, we go back to the Parnell administration. Remember when he built a budget that was based on forecasting that at the time <clears throat> when they first started, it was $115 a barrel and then oil cratered down to the, what, $80 mark, $75, $80 mark. But he was holding to that $115 a barrel projection for his budgeting. I mean, this has been part of the problem the whole time. We're betting on the if come of these projections. And that's why plank number four of the charter of changes has changed the funding, changed the way that we do it. I've advocated for an average take for years that that's what we should do. We should look at what our average has been for the last five years and whatever that average is over five years, that's where we should start the budget or just zero based budgeting. I mean, one of the two, we can't just keep propping it up every year and hoping on the best, which is what we're doing right now. Yeah, basically what we're doing now, basically what we're doing, oil prices will go back down. I mean, you can you can you can bet on that as as certainly as as anything you can you can bet on. Oil prices will go back down. But what we're doing is especially with Delanus, let's put it off in the capital budget. Let's just build more things. Um it it is it it is we're 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 riding the peaks, right? We got more money. Bam, we, we can do more spending. We got more money, bam, we can do additional programs. We got more money. Bam! We can increase the capital budget. But what's going on in the valleys? 
And the Valleys is, well, we'll just take more out of the PFD. Or we'll, we'll just tax middle and lower income Alaska families more right. to pay for it. Used to be we'll tax future generations by taking it out of the CBR until we took all their money. And now we're, and now we're just going to tax middle and lower income Alaska families to fill to fill in the valleys and, yeah. and the and the budget's riding the peaks. So you'd think you'd learn from all the past mistakes of spending fifteen billion dollars out of the CBR that we just couldn't continue along that path. But no, they seem to be happy to move right along. Greg makes a great point. More capital projects. We can't maintain the ones we already built. I mean, that's the problem, isn't it? The state's got what three quarters of a billion dollars in deferred maintenance hanging out there that they haven't. Uh, that they're not taking, I mean, you know, oh, we should fix this black mold in this. Yes, we probably should. That should probably be a priority. We probably should sacrifice some of these lesser needed programs to make sure that the schools and the buildings that we have right now stay upright and maintained and safe to occupy. I mean, yeah, you'd think that that would be a priority. Oh, there's a special place in hell for the for the guy who thought up deferred maintenance at this point, Brad. It's absolutely crazy. Well, and 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 to think you're only going to get to think you're only going to get deferred maintenance run down when you have bumps in the bumps in the spending. I mean, that's <laughs> deferred maintenance doesn't wait for bumps in spending. They don't wait for good revenue forecasts. They're sitting there getting worse and worse and worse. So yeah, we ought to be we ought to be funding those on a regular basis as opposed to, I, I mean, Michael, there's so much stuff that we ought to be doing. We ought to be paying back the CBR. We ought to be taking back this this jumbo loan. Uh, from future generations, we ought to be paying it back. We ought to be distributing the PFD in accordance with the with the statute, in accordance with uh, Hammond's vision to build up a private sector in this state. Um, we ought to be doing maintenance on a regular schedule as opposed to as opposed to deferring it. Uh, but you know <laughs> that the, the the attraction of oh my gosh, I got people in my office who want me to spend more on this. And, and right. I've got you know, favorite industries that I want to sprinkle additional fairy dust on. Uh, just we, we have legislators who are not, who, who, who cannot overcome that. Uh, Senator Rob Myers corrected me. I was wrong. <clears throat> I remember now the three quarters of a billion number was the Anchorage number. Um, Rob said the last time he checked, it was over ten billion dollars in deferred maintenance in the state of Alaska. So ten b billion with a B. So that means between the CBR and the deferred maintenance, we got a twenty billion dollar hole, and we're out there saying, "Oh, look, we could spend it on the next patch of sprinkles that we need to spend it on." I mean, ten billion dollars. Uh, you know, you want to build more. And yet we can't even keep up what we've got. You people, you people. You know, that's a good observation. I've never thought of it that way. I've never thought of adding deferred maintenance as a, as another borrow borrowed account yeah. uh, to the, to the CBR, but that's, that's a great way of looking at it. That's a, because we are, we're, that's another, that's another loan we've taken from future generations because we're sticking them with the bill for the deferred maintenance, or we're sticking them with the, with rotting buildings. Uh, uh, as a result of not uh, funding maintenance on an ongoing basis. Well, I mean, I've so always thought the arrogance of people to go, oh, well, we, yeah, sure, we need maintenance on this building or that building, but really this program is more important. I've always, I have voted against anything that is deferred maintenance. When I was on the borough assembly, I ranted several times about this. That, that you know, I mean, the Fairbanks North Star Borough, a place has got less than 100,000 people had had a quarter of a billion dollars in deferred maintenance. I mean that that's that's insanity for a place that had for a place that had was when I left it was like 150 million dollars a year annually in budgeting and they had three quarters of or they had a quarter of a bill 280 million dollars in deferred maintenance. I'm like how can you how can any of those folks be trusted? We've taken you given our we've given you our money. You've built all these facilities. You keep saying it's important, and yet at the same time, you keep taking money from those maintenance, the things that are supposed to maintain these investments, and you spend it on other stuff. That that be that is the most offensive thing that I could think of. Yeah, that's a great way. Of, that's a great way of looking at it. I mean, it's a great way of of, of thinking about it. I need to I need to factor that into the into my charts uh, somehow. And add it to the, you know, because I talk about paying back the CBR, amortizing the CBR on a on a set schedule over a certain right. period of time, paying back the debt, the loan we've taken from future generations. Uh, 
<laughs> Donna, she's just a ray of sunshine today. Don't forget the unfunded liabilities. I mean, that's, that's another, what, $7 billion just for the pension fund right now in unfunded liability. Oh, we're up to $27 billion. Okay. <laughs> all right. So we put all of that in context, and now we get a little bit of additional money that shows up in the spring revenue forecast. Money we shouldn't even be paying attention to because we ought to be budgeting on the basis of, of averages, uh, annual aver historical averages. Uh, but we get a little bit of money uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the budget, and now you know we're going to spend it on new programs, new capital projects, or we're going to spend it on 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 increases in the BSA, or we're going to why spend, would you spend it why, on this? Why would you spend it on new capital projects when you can't keep the capital projects you've got up? I mean, that's you know that's the. Oh, it's madness. It's total and absolute madness at this point. Brad Keithley, uh, the weekly top three. Number three. Uh, I leave it to you, my friend. Number three. So there's an article in the in this week's edition of The Economist. And The Economist, I think, is a is a great resource to to tap into uh, occasionally to you know understand bigger themes of what's going on out there in the world. Um, and this one is uh, the the headline of it is Oil's Endgame could be highly disruptive. The oil shocks of the future will be driven by demand, uh, not supply. And it, it is an article that looks into the, the rapidly approaching future uh, that, that the world says that they've set for themselves uh, to reduce carbon emissions of, uh, of ramping down uh, oil, uh, oil demand uh, uh, as, a, as a way of doing that. Uh, converting oil demand over to other uh, uh, non as carbon intensive uh, uh, sources of uh, sources of energy and it's it's a great it's a great insight into into what goes on and and keep in mind i have trouble doing this sometimes but keep in mind that 2050 which is the target date that we've now set for all these reductions in co2 emissions all this reduction in carbon 2050 is only 26 years away um, it is it is almost as close to where we are now as 2020 or 20, 2000 is to where we are now. We're 26 years away from 2050. We're 24 years away from 2000. And when you put it in that sort of perspective, I mean, 2000 to 20 to 2024 to me is sort of like a blink of an eye, right? I can remember exactly where I was in 2000. I, it just doesn't seem that long ago. And, and 2020, 2050, which is, you know, the, the date for all of the, the, we're targeting to get all these CO2 emissions down is, uh, is as near as, as, as that is looking in the rearview mirror. So, um, it's, it, we're starting, I'm starting to see these articles. I'm starting to see these thought pieces about what that means for oils, for oils end game. And it's really, it's really insightful. I mean, the, not only do they have the world's largest supply of, of reserves, but the Middle East also has the largest supply of low carbon reserves. And the, and the, and the thought is that through carbon taxes or in some fashion, we will start squeezing out the higher carbon sources of energy, higher, higher carbon sources of oil uh, as we get toward 2050 and we'll, we'll ramp down toward the lowest carbon uh, sources of oil from that time forward and the middle east has not only the largest uh, uh source of supply of uh, of oil but they also the largest reserves but they also have the largest reserves perversely and this is what the article says perversely this shift will will grant some producers more market power the biggest least carbon intensive and cheapest reserves of petroleum by far are found in saudi arabia and the immediate opec neighbors in the persian gulf as the market for oil shrinks their share of production will show, will soar. Depending on the pace of energy transition, the cabal could command a market share of half or even two thirds of global supply of global output by 2050, according to BP and oil firm, compared with less than 40% uh, market share today. So by some measures, the thought is that as we shrink down uh, uh, oil, we're going to put more and more of command of the market into the Middle East, which, you know, results in uh, likely would result in increased price. At least some people say it results in increased price. There are others who suggest that'll be chipped away in certain fashions, but 
but likely results in uh, in, in increased price, um, dramatically increased price, which frankly, if you look at economics, will then drive more conversion to lower cost uh, energy sources by then lower cost energy sources uh, as we go. I tried to think about what the consequence of this is for Alaska and what, what this what 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 this future means for Alaska. And, and there's a couple ways I thought about it. One is we are really fortunate, really fortunate that we're getting two new big development projects underway uh, as we hit this ramp down. One is Willow, Conoco's Willow project, and the other is Oil Search's uh, uh, PICA project um, and Santos, I guess now. Pika project and those two big projects, uh, the way that North Slope, the way the the, the long live reserves on the, the that you find in the North Slope North Slope projects go, uh, those long live reserves will will carry us a significant way toward uh, 2050. And if oil price goes up, as the market narrows and oil price goes up, then we should be a beneficiary of that. Uh, but the other way to think about it is maybe we don't get any more. That, that Willow and Pika is sort of the end of the line in terms of what Alaska is going to get. We're not the highest carbon region in the world, highest oil carbon, uh, carbon content region in the world, but we're not the lowest either. Um, and as, as demand ramps down, given, given this future, um, we may not get any more than uh, Willow and, uh, and Pika. And that's, I sort of back into concerns, a lot of concerns about what's going on why, why do these production numbers from, from the North Slope, from the traditional sources on the North Slope, keep ramping down faster than what the projections are? They're, if, if, they're, if we're going to ramp down those traditional sources fairly fast and, and we get Willow and Pika, but that's sort of the end of the line, then we're facing a future where you know, we're going to be having a ramp down on, on, on oil production uh, faster than I think you know, some people have, have taken into account. Lot, a lot of different factors in there, but the but the but the the economist makes a compelling case that we're that we're coming into a future where we're going to hit that. I mean, people say, "Oh no, we're not. We're never going to do you know CO two reduction. We just ought to accept that." I don't think that's true. I think the world is going to force a lower CO two content world, and and we need to be thinking about what and we need to be thinking about what that means. It's an issue, frankly, that I want legislators that I, from my personal perspective as a, as a voter, I want legislators and gubernatorial candidates to be thinking about and talking about. I want them to be thinking about what it means for Alaska to have, to have a, an oil world as the economist is describing an oil world where the Middle East is getting more and more control that has an effect on price, uh, but it also has an effect as this, as this shrinking oil world uh, sort of sloughs off non-Middle East sources of supply, uh, what that means, uh, what, what that means for Alaska oil development. We're only 26 years away from 2050. And, and, and you know, that can happen in the blink of an eye. We need to be following programs, policies. We need to be thinking through the consequences now to prepare us for, 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 you know, the ramp down that, that, that goes on right. before, before we hit 2050. Is there any way for us to, I mean, is there any way for us to avoid that? I mean, I, again, Alaska, are you saying Saudi has the, the lowest carbon crude out there? Is there any way to mitigate those, uh, those things in the future? Expensively. Um, and, and maybe some of those things will be justified, but you know, carbon extraction or carbon, carbon control or carbon sequestration, uh, is something that you can do, but it's really, it's, it's a lot of that is in the quality of the crude that you're producing, um, and, and the CO2 that's embedded in the crude. So it's really hard to take steps to strip that carbon out of the crude, uh, uh on its way before it, before it heads off to, uh, to its uses. Um, so I, I mean, th that's one of the things that I guess we ought to be thinking about. Are there things we can do? to better position Alaska in this narrowing crude uh, future. But it's but Alaska is so dependent on oil uh, and will continue to be dependent on oil until we until we find a different way of 
of, of, of establishing our revenue stream in the state government or contract the size uh, of state government to sort of get ourselves prepared for a lower revenue future. Um, it, it is the one thing that's certain is it's going to affect Alaska as a, as a, as a, as a heavily dependent economy, heavily dependent on crude economy. It's going, that future is going to affect Alaska and we need leaders who are thinking about that, who are saying things like, is there a way that we can get our, is there a way we can get the carbon content of our crude down? Are there steps we can take to position ourselves better um, into that future to maintain our production better um, into that future? Uh, we need people thinking about that, talking about that, considering that, developing policies uh, in response to that. Just letting, just sliding along as we've been doing is is sort of a recipe for disaster because we slide into this future as 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 production from traditional sources legacy sources ramp down fast faster and faster uh, than 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 the projections are telling us that we're going to do um, and as and, and as we don't get follow-on projects behind willow and pika we sort of hit that future you know well, face on face on fairly quickly we can't even get people to think beyond the next election cycle. 26 years, that's a millennium from now for most of these people. They're not even considering it, which is unfortunate because, again, if that does come about and we lose the ability to use oil as the main force of state revenue, we're going to have some issues. I mean, how do we how do we expect these people to be thinking those 26 years in the future, Brad? I mean, at this point, how do we get people to even think about it? They're you know we're we're duking it out year to year on things that uh should be taken care of and and should be laid out and and planned and and we can't even get you know a two-year plan let alone a five-year plan let alone a 20-year plan uh this is a this is a huge problem we, we 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 need to be electing people who talk about plans michael who talk about taking into consideration uh, uh, these sort of factors and develop develop uh, uh, fiscal measures that that respond to them. I mean, we've now Ma Matt Buxton, who I I agree with often, not always, but I agree with often. Matt Buxton had a great comment yesterday. He said, "We have now made the BSA another PFD that will be determined." by legislature, each legislature on the on on the basis of whatever the forces of politics are at the time. And it's another it's another one of these near term diversions that that we're going to have near term, you know, debates that we're going to have uh, like we do with the with the PFD that just suck all the oxygen out of the out of the room. We, we have stopped being we have stopped being a state that's ruled by law. And we and we we have put ourselves into a situation. It began with the PFD. Matt's comment is that we're now subjecting the BSA to the same forces. We pass the statute. We have laws on the books that tell us how to deal with this stuff, and 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 put it on autopilot, so we can think about other things. But now we've put ourselves in a situation where none of that stuff's on autopilot. It's all up for debate every year. You know, how much the PFD is going to be is up for debate every year. How much the BSA is going to be is now up for debate uh, every year. Those are two huge things and they suck a lot of oxygen. We ought to find what we ought to, we ought to look for people who say, look, we need to put that stuff behind us. We need to settle these things once and for all, put them on autopilot, respect the rule of law. When we pass the statute, follow it as opposed to, you know, just throw it out the window uh, at, at any given point in time respect the rule of law, follow the statutes and think about the bigger things that we're facing or else we're going to stumble into that future unprepared and it's going to it's going to you know do very bad things to us if we're unprepared for it. I, I, I think part of what it is is we look for candidates who say, let's respect the rule of law, let's settle this stuff through statutes. let's respect that. Uh, and if we need a constitutional amendment that says we're going to respect the rule of law, let's put that in the Constitution uh, and go on from and, and, and build a future looking forward as opposed to always fighting about the past, always fighting about the things that we've that we've created in the past. And I and, and there and I and I guess part of what struck me about this economy, economist article is there are things, big things sitting out there, not big, positive things, big 
challenges, big risks that are sitting out there in front of Alaska. We're not even paying attention to because we're all busy fighting about the, you know, the battle of the moment, refighting the battle of the PFD and now refighting the battle of the, of the BSA, uh, fighting the battle of the moment, as opposed to looking forward and seeing what we're running into. And we've left the next generation with nothing in the bank to deal with it. We've drained the CBR. This generation has made its life better by draining the CBR, putting off, you know, the hard choices by continuing to tap into that, into that savings until there's nothing there. We're passing on nothing, no, no shock absorbers for future generations. We've used up all the shock absorber for, for ourselves. So, you know, we're, we're battling, we're battling all these past things. We can't get anything settled because we have no rule of law anymore. We just thrown statutes, fiscal statutes out the, out the window. We can't get anything settled about the past. We've drained down the shock absorbers that were that were meant to be there to help generations. Our generation, we drained it down. We need to pay it back. But we 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 we've drained the shock absorber that's meant to be there to help future to help generations accommodate to, to changes. We've drained it down. We're not paying it back, and we're facing these big things. So to me, it's saying we need a candidate that says, let's settle the past. Let's have rule of law again. Here's how I propose to have rule of law. Now, let's start looking forward and let's start positioning Alaska to, to, to be ready for these things that, we're, that are going to hit us in the future. I mean, this is all well and good, Brad. This is all well and good in theory. Unfortunately, the reality is um, it's just the next cycle. It's just the next election cycle. we got to make sure that we get taken care of and nobody is thinking about the long-term stuff. That's, I mean, if they were thinking about the long-term stuff, they'd be looking at the 10-year forecast and realizing that what we're on right now is an unsustainable grade. I mean, they are—they would understand that already. But they, they, you know, that what you're talking about is way too big and amorphous even for that. But it's something, I mean, I guess I guess my point is, and, and, and I don't mean to belabor it, but I, but I guess I do mean to belabor it. It's something that's sitting out there, Michael. It's something, it's something big that's sitting out there that because it's hitting our core industry and our core resource is going to have a big impact on us. And, and it's something, if we don't think about it, if we don't prepare for it, if we don't take the steps to position future generations, give them back the shock absorber. If we don't prepare future generations to deal with it, it's just going to wipe them out. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, you're not in charge. That's unfortunate <laughs> at this point. Uh, all right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you. Thank you for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3. <laughs>